Hello there. Very good morning. This is Newsline. I'm Sonali Manikabaduke. Our guest this morning is Malinda Seniviratna, political commentator and writer. Good morning and welcome, Malinda. Good morning. Sir. Good to have you here on Newsline. Uh, Malinda, what actually is happening to the country? I mean, uh, today um, in the morning when I was coming at 5.30 a.m., there were still queues formed outside uh, fuel stations. Now, um, the Ministry of, uh, the Secretary to the Ministry of Petroleum Resource Development says that petrol will also not be issued in cans until the 9th of this month. So we have a general public that drives either bikes or three-wheelers or cars or jeeps. Uh, who are now unable to pump fuel, they can't take their vehicles to the petrol station, and now they are told that they can't uh, even get the fuel in uh, cans. cans. Well, it's not just the, those people you mentioned, it's also transportation of goods uh, and lorries and buses, Absolutely. all those things are affected. Now, fuel shortages are not like, uh, I mean, we have had fuel shortages in this country and all over the world. Uh, this is not the first time, so you, know, you can't really... Uh, bang the government on the head, there's a fuel shortage. But uh, if one shipment of uh, you know, low quality fuel being turned away uh, generates a crisis of this order, mm. what it uh, indicates is uh, a lack of readiness. You know, where is the risk aversion of this uh, government? You know, they know that this is going to happen. Uh, one thing that quickly happened was rumors. Mm. Uh, and uh, so therefore the, the the status of the real nature of the problem was not properly, properly communicated and action to deal with uh, the obvious outcome uh, was, was not forthcoming until, until yesterday, I think, when, when this uh, communique came from the ministry. Uh, there should have been rationing at some point. There should have been a ban on uh, cans, uh, fuel being sold in cans. They should have moved some fuel from uh, you know, low uh, the demand areas to high demand areas, but what happened was there was an immediate spike in demand, and uh, therefore you get the queues. I mean, that's a natural uh, kind sure, of demand outcome. and supply. Yeah, demand and supply. No, now for example, about four days ago, I was coming to Colombo. I saw the, that the Bokmundara petrol shed was uh, closed. I mean, they said no, no petrol. I didn't know of anything. That afternoon, when I was going back, uh, I saw the, the Redimola petrol shed open and I just went there. Now, there were two cars and there were a whole bunch of three wheelers, so I kind of figured there's something happening. I usually pump only about you know, 1,000 rupees worth of petrol. I don't have money to right. <laughs> anymore, but fortunately that day I had enough money to have a full tank. I did. So people who were getting five, 500 rupees worth of petrol were buying 1,000, and people who were getting 1,000 were getting a, a full tank. Sure. So naturally the, the supply dried up uh, very fast. The problem is that the government has not been able to respond to arrest the anxieties and uh, you know all these other issues. Uh, now, the rumors up. started on Friday. Uh, uh, evening and uh, we didn't hear an official response to this uh, until much later uh, which which goes on to create a lot of uh, anxiety as you said among the general public so uh, what does this say of uh, the readiness of the, uh, gov the government and uh, the inability to implement a contingency plan as it were well, this government has been marked by uh, a really sorry state uh, i mean very uh, sad uh, ability to communicate things right or wrong you know tell the public the truth and deal with it uh, sometimes they pass the buck, sometimes they hide it or try to hide it on the carpet, but you know, this petrol crisis, the fuel crisis, shortages, you can't really do that. <laughs> it comes out on the street, it's on your screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that, I mean, from Friday, now I, I read it on, on social media, people were saying pro-government, people were saying, petrol hinge ak nata, drushaman aranchi, saman no den. Mm. When the truth is, uh, petrol hinge ak nata, there is a, is a petrol shortage and uh, you know, don't listen to those rumors which says there, there are no uh, uh, shortages. So the communication issue was obviously uh, I mean, very apparent. Immediately you, you deal with it. I don't know why that has not happened. In, uh, I mean, why, why it took so long for people to get their act together. So how does a government go about getting its act together, in your opinion? Well, if there's communication among the, the leadership, uh, which is also a split government, as we know. Uh, people like to pass the buck 
across the board, you know, SLFP, UNP, that kind of thing is happening. But mm. then there is always a minister who is in um, uh, the line minister, uh, line minister sure. uh, who should have uh, moved very quickly to tell the truth and say okay, and and take action. Say okay, these are the measures that we are taking. We are going to have this shortage. In the long run, that is better. Uh, maybe they thought that uh, if we say there's a shortage. Uh, People will panic. People panicked anyway, yes. uh, and uh, that uh, somehow uh, there will be a black spot on the gun. That spot is already there. Yeah. So you can mitigate that by the truth, by telling the truth, hmm. and uh, saying, "Okay, we have a problem. We are going to deal with it. You help us." Right. Now, um, the ministry has also said, the Ministry of Petroleum uh, Development has also said that police security uh, uh, will be provided to uh, fuel stations uh, to deal with any um, uh, incidents uh, that may arise. Uh, so it is a bit of a serious uh, situation, Marlene. I yep. mean, a, a small situation which could have been uh, no controlled. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the police. Mm -hmm. I saw footage of uh, some VIP coming uh, with some police officers and uh, jump in the queue and uh, an ordinary citizen who was there taking issue with Right. We should be glad that that person has not been taken in a white van and so on. But still, uh, if the police is there to protect the people, you know, they, they, then it's fine. But mm -hmm. what we are seeing is Police escorts and other, you know, you get these cods, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the motorcades and all this. And they come in, they jump the queue, they uh, throw their weight around and demand that uh, uh, their bosses' uh, vehicle be filled. Hmm. Uh, so it is a serious situation if, if this has, it has come to this. But if they are saying by the ninth things are going to get, then we have to, we have to really bear with it, you know. We, take a bus, we walk, we take a bicycle. That is what the people should do, a responsible citizenry, which we don't have, unfortunately, would understand that, you know, we have to manage the things uh, you know, as best we can. Right. Now, uh, we have in Sri Lanka a 50-year-old refinery. We have 100 tanks in Trincomalee. Then, we, on the other hand, we have um, an entire country waiting for a ship to uh, arrive in Sri Lanka and everything is at a standstill. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, multi-purpose mega development projects such as um, uh, the Port city and uh, yeah, financial city project, then all these highways. Uh, the Rajakiriya flyover, um, you know, all of these things it's, it's happening. About priorities. So, where are we going wrong in prioritizing? Yeah. And who, who, like everybody is passing the buck. Yes, uh, well, you can't, the possibility of a fuel shortage should not uh, stop people from planning and executing development strategies mm -hmm. like the mega uh, development uh, port city and but financial cities. But for us cities. to go, go for mega development projects, shouldn't we first sort out the fuel? Yeah, there was an interesting comment on uh, Facebook. I mean, it's a picture that has been passed around where it says, me. Before you start, uh, you know, distributing power, power. you know, uh, yeah. devolving power, first start distributing uh, petrol. Mm. So that kind of uh, humor, mm. uh, well, like critic, uh, you are opening yourself to that kind of critic. But when you talk about prioritizing, now one thing that we are we have we seem to have forgotten in the in the midst of this fuel crisis is that we have a very serious. Uh, a process of constitutional reform, mm -hmm. which uh, has already uh, you know, gone off the radar. Then uh, we have the bond scam issue. No one is talking about it. The Prime Minister is supposed to uh, uh, give evidence. Mm -hmm. No one is talking about it. Because all of a sudden, uh, there's a fuel crisis. And uh, that is not, I'm not saying that these are deliberately planned to shift attention of the public and so on. Mm -hmm. But then it's, it's the responsibility of the citizen to, you know, be alert to, to things that, you know, these are not one of these. It's like, you know, once you had Ratapasula, once you had DCD, then we had Coca-Cola in the Kalniganga, and one issue goes out, the next one, then there's that little girl who was abducted and raped and killed. Uh, one issue comes with capitalism is crisis, by definition. Mm. They don't mind crisis as, as long as they don't sno snowball into revolution or something like that, but uh, uh, if one crisis makes you forget the other, then you have a certain quantum of crisis all the time, uh, which, uh, peop which will distract people. Then we might be in a World Cup or something like that and we forget the f that we don't have petrol. I, I don't think uh, <laughs> there's much of a possibility of... Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so, um, 
the lack of proper management is what we're talking about, yes. uh, isn't it, Malik? Absolutely, sir? as I said. In all spheres, all not just uh, governance and government, yes. but also it, it extends to sports, sadly. Uh, it extends to all other areas as well. Yes, because now someone was talking about good governance mm. the other day, and uh, I said that, you know, forget the good. At lo as long as they have some governance, mm -hmm. okay. and that there should be some governance. Right. There is no coherence in, the, in this government uh, in the first place. They don't seem to have a coherent policy. One person says one thing, the other person contradicts that person. Mm -hmm. And then you go on and then you start bickering and the opposition tries to you know, uh, move in and make political capital out of it. No one seems to be very serious about this business of governance. In the meantime, there's a lot of theft happening, there's nepotism, corruption, abuse of state resources, all those things are happening. We don't have abductions and white men killings yet. Hmm. That could happen because already they have started uh, attacking uh, demonstrators with tear gas and uh, baton charging them and water cannons and so on. Things which they were, the human rights lobby in Sri Lanka made a huge fuss over during the previous regime. They're quite silent right now. Hmm. So uh, there's a huge management problem. I mean, if you don't have a plan, how can you manage a plan? You must have a plan before you can manage it. Mm. But they don't seem to have that. So contingency measures are thrown out of the window in the first place, because you haven't come to base to the first base yet. So that is, I think, uh, I mean, it's an overall crisis. This is a symptom. Right. So um, how can we rectify this? I mean, going forward, do you think that um, those that are elected to office should then have uh, more, should be more qualified? I mean, how do we assess this? Yeah, as of now, the constitution only states that uh, to be elected as a parliamentarian, you need to be a citizen of the country and um, you shouldn't have a criminal record and some criteria like that. But uh, there is no basic minimum qualification. Uh, but in countries like Canada, we see the Minister of Health is is um, is someone who is an expert in that field. Uh, or we do have a Minister of that Health. That is who is true. Ready. That is correct. But it doesn't extend to the other ministries. Whether he is competent or not is a different matter. But uh, there is a thing like this. Now we are going to have uh, local government elections very soon. Mm. Now the, the local government council a body should, is, should be in the village. The village should not be in the local com, uh, government com, uh, body, and the local government uh, body should not be the Pradesh Sabha should not be in the in the pocket of a political party. So there is a representation uh, issue that goes from the grassroots right up. Right, mm -hmm. uh, the the people of some social standing, some respect in the community. They are not the people who are getting elected, even at the local government level. So you, it goes up, then you, you uh, it's like a training ground for thugs and crooks, mm. and they graduate to the provincial councils, and they graduate to parliament, and, and then to cabinet, and to the presidency. Mm. So uh, we have a system which uh, which is by uh, in in effect mm. anti-democratic, and it is not representation. So if you are not getting people's representatives in parliament, except by name, we mm. elect them. Uh, then uh, you are not going to get competent people. You are going to get people who are who are pursuing self-interest. So uh, how do we how do we get competent people, and why have we failed thus far? Well, well, the system is skewed against uh, in favor of those who have either money, mm -hmm. or you have uh, people who have uh, an, a network of thugs, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know that kind of thing. So, if you have uh, legislation about campaign finance, disclosing sure. uh, assets and liabilities at the beginning. And when you leave, uh, then we actually have uh, an act which mandates that asset declarations. Asset should be declaration made. should be made at the point of departure as well, at the end of the term as well. I don't think that we have that, and um, and uh, I mean that that has to be you know very strictly monitored. Some anyone can give an asset declaration. I can say I have only this much, mm -hmm. but then uh, it has to be audited. So we, if we don't have that kind of system. Uh, then uh, we are making, we are making, uh, 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 inviting people to be corrupt, even those who are not. So you are just creating. We have a culture and a system that is flawed. So, unfortunately, correcting the flaws is also in the hands of the flawed people, the people who are corrupt, who are going to act. In the Seventeenth Amendment was an anomaly. 
right? I don't think most of the people who, who raised their hands to it uh, had even read it. And so to the, the 19th, you know, the party text, fortunately at that time, at both occasions were leadership. They, we had leaders who were able to push it through. But we had also leaders who pushed through the 18th Amendment and all the, the 16 amendments that came before. The 14th Amendment, which is illegal uh, and uh, uh, made to uh, allow, uh, in part, to allow those who lost elections to come through the national list. That is, I mean, that is part of our constitution. And that was done illegally and very, uh, in a very underhand way by the former president, uh, J.R. Chayavadana. Uh, just before he lost uh, the UNP lost its two thirds uh, majority in parliament. So, so we have a constitutional crisis. Uh, and we are we are talking about dev devolving power, and this, no one is talking about making these very necessary corrections to the constitution. Why not? Mm -hmm. It's easy for them to devolve things that they don't that don't really belong to them. But if you legislate for things that will inhibit your ability to uh, be corrupt, then you're a statesman. I don't think we have. Such people. Do we have statesmen in Sri Lanka? We'll find out right after this commercial break. Stay with us. Good morning. Welcome back. You're with Newsline. We're in conversation with Amalinda Seniviratna, a writer and political commentator. Um, Amalinda, we were in the midst of a very interesting uh, discussion about governance, constitutional reform and crisis. Um, what then is the role of the citizen? Is it only that of a bystander and that of a voter just before elections? What is really the role of a citizen, I a good citizen? Yeah, I think that uh, we have a very flawed understanding of what is political. We think right. that uh, politics begins when uh, parliament is dissolved or an election is called and it uh, ends when the elections commissioner announces the results. That is uh, very erroneous. I mean, that is not what po politics is everything, uh, unfortunately. But uh, a citizen's responsibility doesn't start on the, at 7 o'clock on polling day and ends at 4.30 or whatever time the polls oh. close. Uh, part of being a responsible citizen in a representative democracy or whatever you want to call it is to be alert at all times, is to articulate uh, concerns uh, and grievances uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, through any means uh, uh, available. Unfortunately, the, the system which ideally would have us telling our representatives, this is what we feel, that doesn't work. So we have to go to the newspapers, we have to go to the media, we have to use social media, we just vent our anger and our frustrations there, and no one is listening. So there's a, as I said, there's a big flaw in the overall institutional arrangement that makes for for meaningful citizenship. Um, the laws are flawed, the, the entire judicial system is corrupt, and uh, they, uh, now, as I, I was speaking about the 14th Amendment and uh, the fact that it is not being corrected, the executive, uh, legislative and judicial arms of the state are all complicit in this. So uh, we, our citizenship is uh, seriously diminished and compromised and uh, I don't think that uh, our politicians are ready to rectify those things. So I hope we don't get to a situation where frustrations uh, spill out of the political, the, the mainstream political process and you know spills out in the street and uh, becomes bloody. We can't afford that I think but uh, uh, that is where we are heading unfortunately. Right. So, what what is the role of the good citizen? That is uh, that is my question to you. The good citizen is the person who, at that petrol station, when that uh, political thug came with his goons, mm. unfortunately, whose salaries are being paid by by the citizens themselves, mm. the police, and tried in a very high-handed man manner to uh, jump the queue and get his uh, vehicle. And that politician didn't understand what his uh, limits are. The, his office, uh, officers, his security uh, detail, they didn't understand where their uh, official <laughs> uh, is limited. But there was that citizen who stood up and said, this is wrong. Mm. This is wrong. You can't do this. I will not stand for it. Any citizen who can see something wrong happening. There was a friend of mine who, who was uh, in a traffic jam in Barakapola because there was this Scott Decker. 
And uh, he had stopped the car in the middle of the road and got out and told the security people in the backup vehicle, I pay for you, you can kill me, but that bullet that you're using is mine. I pay for it. I pay for your gun, I pay for your service, I pay for the education and food of your children. I pay for the fuel in this uh, vehicle. Mm. If for the last 70 years, your boss, I don't know who he is, and others like him had done what they were supposed to do, then we wouldn't have this traffic jam here. And he got into the car. I think they were too surprised and shocked that some citizen got. But that is the kind of citizenship that that will that will uh, see us through this there are people who refuse to take bribes mm -hmm. there are very good public officials who refuse to take bribes they get uh, penalized they get uh, interdicted they have to go to courts they have to starve mm -hmm. but they do it we have to suffer some uh, a lot if we are if we are to recover our citizenship and it takes courage it takes uh, commitment and it takes uh, say uh, something goodness, uh, good about you, a, a sense of responsibility uh, to yourself, your families and your fellow citizens. That is the kind of citizenship that will help us uh, overturn this. Where does one um, <coughs> nurture this feeling? Literature and the arts. Literature and the arts, which draws me, it brings me to my next question. Uh, where does uh, literature feature in our curriculum, in our education system? Well, we are not taught literature, at least I, uh, the, the curriculums that we have, don't see literature in that way. I mean, you can, it doesn't have to be, you know, Shakespeare or, or Martin Vikram Singh or anything like that. Even the Bible, Bible is a track for a revolution. The Dhammapada has a lot of uh, uh, content which uh, makes for better citizenship, better conduct as a citizen, as a human being. Mm -hmm. So maybe we are teaching literature wrong. Mm -hmm. We are told to memorize verses and uh, re and reflect on the on the uh, on the content, mm -hmm. but. Uh, we are not encouraged to be very critical, to analyze it, to see what is it like Michelangelo's uh, paintings. They're very subversive. He painted <coughs> within the frame he, that he was commissioned to paint, you know, God and a man. But he managed, even within those restrictions, to come up with a very radical uh, portrayal of the whole uh, cosmo cosmos. How man created God, uh, but we are not taught that. We are not taught to read it that way. Okay, so Malinda, are you saying that we are spewing out um, <coughs> young people mm -hmm. out of schools and universities who are not critical in their thinking, who are who don't question? Well, we if we had, I, I, I'm I'm not saying that schools should be uh, where where people are taught how to how to rebel and how to how to revolt, mm -hmm. but if we are given critical abilities, mm -hmm. analytical skills. We don't have analytical skills in our curriculum, very little, and we are not taught the, you know, any, we are not taking civic responsibility in a very responsible manner. We're not right. teaching it. Like, for example, there are schools, uh, government schools, uh, private schools, which get free, free books. Right. Uh, someone is paying for that. They are, they are children of parents who can afford to buy those books, but still the government pays, uh, gives them books. Mm -hmm. The citizens pay for it. Mm -hmm. But if they are taught, you know, this is where these books come from. Someone is paying for it. It's a taxpayers. It's not just the big corporations who are, they pass on the taxes to, to the citizen. When you are buying your take or your senior or whatever, you are paying a tax. Mm -hmm. That is how they, they deal with taxes. So uh, that is where the money comes from. You have a responsibility to the people who have helped you uh, educate yourself. That kind of civic education we are lacking in us in our, in our entire curriculum in a school system. So are we are we going to call for an overhaul of the education oh, system? Well, the overhaul of the education system is uh, long overdue. But basic things, if you want to match education with the economy, mm. why don't you have an occupational classification? We lack an occupational classification. We don't know how many engineers we need, how many doctors, how many tailors, how many what not. Uh, in 2020, in 2025, 2030, we don't, if we had some kind of classification, then we can tailor our, our education system to provide for that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, not, it doesn't happen, you can't draw straight lines and arrows and things like that. But uh, to be more cognizant of uh, what the requirements are and to have a system which will produce the kind of uh, skills and the human resources that can uh, uh, 
fill that de de that meet that demand that is that kind of thinking we lack it's easy to say scrap the arts faculty uh, you know privatize education but th those are just sloganeering i mean that is just scratching the surface to go deep down look at the economy look at where we are heading look at where the world is going so who, who who's going to do that who are we directing these this things question, to the political leadership the political leadership is not listening to professionals the the whole agreement with uh, india on trade they are they are not listening to the professionals they are not uh, interested in even citing uh, some minister has a personal agenda and uh, that is what frames uh, the entire logic of uh, engagement that is not how you should how it should be and at the end of the day you uh, you find that the students are have missed their classes state has paid people have paid for for all that and uh, we are in a mess so that question should be unfortunately leveled to a political leadership that does not seem at this point interested in the people they have forgotten their mandate they have forgotten their promises and they have forgotten the people all right uh, we're on to our last uh, three minutes on this show so i'd like to get back to uh, the petroleum crisis that we started off the conversation with because i think both of us have um, and, and a lot of others um, among our viewers have no way of um, getting back home if they are already at work um, now today the ministry of petroleum resources uh, development has said that 2400 metric tons of petrol will be issued so uh, uh, that is uh, some good news um malinda in conclusion i mean we have two minutes more uh, in conclusion how do we avert crisis such as this how do we ensure that there are contingency plans and how do we make sure that we have <coughs> systems in place in the country itself without depending on variable factors this is a right wing government we've had right wing governments since 1977 this is a government uh, that is very friendly to the corporate sector then it's a government made out of businessmen and very close friends of businesses they should know about risk aversion they should know about contingency plans they should know about insurance these are like basic fundamental things of their economic thinking why are they not applying the same kind of thinking to governance right you don't take risks right you especially situations like this because forget everything else your political future is at stake they are interested in themselves so they should be worried about that but then are we supposed to believe are they asking us to believe that they are not they are so sure that they are going to lose the election that they don't give a damn that they'll make all the bucks they can while they are in power right is that the message they want us to take because that is the message that we will take so i think that uh, uh, the you know if you don't have the will the commitment to sort problems to to come up with solutions then you are going to uh, you are going to you have to deal with uh, stuff on the street now it's spilling onto the street in a very small way you know, it's a, as i began this interview i said fuel shortages are not you know they don't uh, they're not uncommon they happen how we deal with it how we respond how we communicate these are basic political i mean a b c of, of politics right if they don't know that how can they talk about constitutional reform how can they uh, talk about uh, sorting out the central bank bond issue how can they talk about anything you know they want to talk uh, peace and reconciliation and all these things but nothing is getting reconciled outside your uh, when you're passing you will see the reconciliation uh, at the petrol ships all right thank you very much malinda seniviratna uh, for joining us on this edition of a uh, news line for the political leadership watching us remember the people are awake